Uh, in my opening statement, I pointed out that everyone who could possibly identify Jesus as the Son of God identified him as the Son of God, the Father, Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, that's the whole Trinity, uh, the angel Gabriel, John the Baptist, Jesus' disciples, Martha, some Romans, and even demons all agreed that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what we read in our earliest records of the life of Jesus. Now, as a Christian, I believe that uh, since Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history and rose from the dead, he obviously has God's stamp of approval on his message. But I tend to trust God's power more than our Muslim friends do. If God is miraculously affirming Jesus' message and authority, God obviously wants people to pay attention to that message. And if God wants that message to get to us, the message is going to get to us. So when I read the first century sources, I take them seriously. Uh, our Muslim friends, I think, have a much lower view of God. They believe that God is powerful enough to perform miracles, but not powerful enough to protect Jesus' message from corruption. Allah says in the Quran that he gave the gospel as a guidance to mankind, and he promised to protect Jesus' followers. But when it came time to protect that gospel and to protect those followers, our Muslim friends tell us that Allah stood by helplessly as the message and the followers were corrupted. Now, Shabir has uh, given us his reasons for um, objecting to the sonship of Jesus. A lot of it is based on the idea of an evolution of the doctrine that at first uh, Jesus was only identified as the son of God in some merely human sense that would apply to other people, and later he was identified in some greater sense. Uh, so I should say a few words, I think, here about what son of God means in the Bible, because we see from uh, Zachar Naik and... Uh, and the, the late Ahmed Didat, that uh, many Muslims think that since other people are called the Son of God, therefore it's, uh, it's not very important when Jesus is called the Son of God. Uh, so, uh, Shabir points out that in Judaism it was common to call God Father, uh, and that other people could be Son. So, what does the phrase Son of God mean in the Bible? Well, it can actually mean several different things, some of which, again, apply to others besides Jesus, and some which apply to Jesus. Um, let's go through a few of the important ones. First, human beings in general are called children of God in Acts 17. Uh, Paul tells us why, because in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, since God is the source of everything we have, even our existence, he's our father in that sense. Uh, so that's human beings, but spirit beings can also be called uh, son of, sons of God, not only because God creates them and sustains them, but presumably because they carry out a role in uh, carrying out God's commands. Third, the nation of Israel, again, is uh, called God's son. In Exodus 4, God tells Moses to say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And here uh, you can see a kind of pattern in that when something is brought about by God, uh, that he can be called the father, in a, in a sense, because he's the one who's, who's producing this. Fourth, the reigning Davidic king, the king who was a descendant of King David, was called son of God because he was put on his throne by God, and he was to rule under God's authority as God's representative. Fifth, and this is a, a very different sense, people who reflect God's will through their conduct can be called sons of God because of a kind of family resemblance with the will of God. So Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. So those are the various senses and according to Shabir, these are the sorts of things that people would be thinking of in the earliest text when they identify Jesus as the son of God. Now, I, I, I take I take the New Testament as inspired, but if we want to be critical, then the, the critical method would be to identify the earliest sources and to distinguish the sources within the sources. And here, scholars would reduce these to uh, Mark, to the Q, hypothetical Q document, to M, that's the unique material in Matthew, uh, to L, that's the unique material in Luke. And you can also uh, have John and Paul as well as our earliest material. I mean, of, of varying degrees of how close they were to the, to the life of Jesus. But our earliest sources, of course, um, would be uh, Mark and Q and Paul. But in all of those sources, you have Jesus identified as the Son, and it's in, it's in a divine sense. So notice I quoted the Gospel of Mark when Jesus is walking on water and his disciples bow down and worshiping, saying he's God's Son. I don't think they mean... Uh, you know, you're, you're a son of God in, in like the sense that all human beings are the son of God. They mean something more if they're bowing down and worshiping him, calling him God's son after walking on the water. 
Uh, so you have, you, that, that's clearly a pretty exalted sense of son of God, if they're worshiping him in connection with this. Uh, we also have Q, but we can identify material that is in this early source, and that would include uh, Jesus saying, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So this is clearly, clearly not the same sense as some of the other senses that apply to human beings. And when you go through Jesus' claims, you can go through any of these sources, M, L, Q, Mark, any of these, and you find Jesus being called the Son of God in a divine sense. So Shabir is simply incorrect that uh, in the earliest sources, he would be identified as a mere human being, and later, uh, later we have an evolution. Jesus is Son of God from the beginning. But to go back to Shabir's points here, One minute. Muhammad brings us this pure monotheism, but, but the, the Muslim sources repeatedly tell us to go to the gospel. And if it's in all of our sources, if, the, if Jesus as son of God in a divine sense, not a merely human sense, is, appears in all of our sources, then if that's wrong, then the gospel message has been corrupt from the beginning. Allah should be telling us, whatever you do, don't go to that message. But when we go there, we find Jesus as the son of God. So the only choice would, to be, complete, would be to be complete skeptics to say we can't know anything. All of the Christian sources have been corrupted and are unreliable. But this would be to say that God, who gave Jesus this miraculous life, and Allah, who promised, promised that he would protect Jesus' true followers until the day of resurrection, that this God failed tremendously, he could not protect it, and Jesus' message was corrupted from the time it was written down, and that Muhammad is later affirming that message, even though it's been corrupt. This, this is just complete incoherence, and that's why I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, Dr. Shapir, we are resetting the clock for seven minutes, and this will give you a chance for your first rebuttal, and you can start right now. <laughs> Okay, so uh, David has mentioned some very interesting points which I'd like to uh, respond to. He said that uh, in, in the Quran, uh, we, we read that uh, God cannot have a uh, son because he has no wife. But what he's missing is that the Quran is rejecting many different ways of speaking of Jesus as the son of God. The Quran is saying uh, God does not have a, a, a son like the ways in which people have thought that God would have a wife and have a son uh, through that wife. Uh, God does not even adopt a son. Ittakhada is the Arabic word which means adoption. He does not uh, adopt a, a, a son. Uh, and it even says, he, he does not have a son, simply put. Uh, so the, from the Quranic perspective, God has no son. Now what's the problem with uh, declaring that, uh, that Jesus is the son of God? Is that uh, some people may actually think that uh, there is a feminine uh, aspect to the deity and somehow the, the two of them, male and female, produce a, a third, which is the son. In fact, uh, Margaret Barker in her book, Christmas, the Original Story, has pointed to an early belief among some Christians uh, that the Holy Spirit was feminine and uh, th 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 somehow that uh, there is a feminine uh, aspect to deity in heaven. And some of this seems to be reflected in the book of Revelation where there is a woman in heaven who gives birth to a, to a child. Uh, so to avoid all of these complications and uh, possible uh, theo theological incorrectness, uh, the Quran just teaches Muslims simply, don't say that God has a son, go back to the original way, which is in the Old Testament where uh, there, there is no son for God. Notice that David just spent a lot of time showing the different ways in which in the Old Testament the son of God is used, but not on one of these ways did he identify that the Son of God in the Old Testament is used for an, uh, a, a somebody who is eternally begotten of God. So the Son of God is angels, even down to the Davidic king, but never one who is ontologically the Son of God from all eternity. So I think that is entirely lacking in the Old Testament, and it uh, points to a major gap in uh, Christian uh, thinking. So when the Quran says, judge by the gospel, it doesn't say the entire gospel as it is now. It says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein. So it's not by the entire gospel that they hold in their hands, but by that which God has revealed uh, within those books that they contain. So we have to do some work of uh, sifting between what is the original revelation and what is later addition and uh, accretion and misinterpretation put there into the, into the document. And yes, God promised to uh, protect the true followers of Jesus and make them uh, uh, zahir. 
uh, over the, the others, uh, uh, apparent that their truth should be apparent and clear. And uh, we see in this that the Quran has a great degree of tolerance. So we, in our small minds, cannot, expect, uh, cannot accept people having slight differences from us. But the Quran, uh, given by God Almighty, uh, comes from that wisdom of God, which knows that human beings are human beings, will differ about a number of things. But God accepts human beings as they are, even with some of their errors, until he outlines the way for them to uh, have a better way forward. So for many centuries, uh, Christians uh, followed the Nicene uh, Creed before the revelation of the Quran, but once the Quran is revealed, now they, everyone is expected to go by for God's final revelation. It's almost like St. Paul himself in one of his letters saying that God has excused uh, many uh, uh, incorrect actions by pagans in the past, but now that the revelation has come through Jesus Christ, now people are expected to follow Jesus. Similarly, we understand that when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has come, people are expected to follow this uh, final uh, prophet. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in communicating to us the Quran, actually gave us that original truth, uh, which was there from uh, the beginning. Uh, David is saying that uh, the earliest records, uh, being Mark and Q and Paul, point to Jesus' divinity. But he has not answered my, uh, my objection to that, which is that John Bowden, in his book, Unans Jesus, the Unanswered Questions, has pointed out that even Mark uh, would have been based on earlier sources, and uh, Mark also... Uh, he evolved uh, the doctrine and, and represented that in the particular way in which he does in his gospel. And Paul, uh, Paul is not the earliest uh, witness to Jesus. The original disciples are. And in fact, uh, as G uh, James Dunn pointed out in his book, uh, Unity and Diversity in the New Testament, uh, some early Christians regarded Paul as an apostate and they regarded G uh, Peter as the champion of the faith. And they knew that there was uh, a, a sharp contrast between the teachings of Peter and the teachings of Paul. So where are the teachings of Peter? We don't have his original writings. We have two letters named after him in the New Testament. But as for the second, Christian scholars generally say that this is not uh, a, a writing from, from Peter. It's actually forged in his name. And as for the first one, First Peter, scholars are divided. So we do not have anything dependably traced back to Peter as his original uh, uh, gospel or his uh, teachings. What about his sayings in Acts of the Apostles and that the sayings of other disciples in the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible? Christian scholars uh, generally say nowadays uh, that uh, these are not originally the speeches of the disciples. Luke, the author, has actually transformed these speeches and presented them in his own way. So we do not have actually the, uh, the absolute earliest records. What we do have uh, is the obvious uh, evolution in doctrine between the Gospels as that, we, that we now can see before our very eyes. And I've given some examples of this to show how the Gospel according to John has actually evolved the story. Uh, let, let's think about uh, how things are represented in Mark some more and, and how they come to be rep misrepresented in the later Gospels. In the Gospel according to Mark, when the, Jesus was uh, asleep on, on a boat, the disciples went to wake him up and they said, uh, Teacher, do you not care if we drown? But in, in, the, in Matthew's Gospel, they address him as Lord. Not only that, in, in the later Gospel, they know exactly what to do. They worship Jesus. Uh, so this is a later development from an original earlier story. So we can see case after case. If in Mark, people address Jesus as rabbi, in the later gospel, they address him as Lord. If they address him as teacher there, in the later gospel, they address him as Lord. Uh, if in the previous gospel, they rebuke him, in the later gospel, they worship him. So this is a clear development in the story. It's not that we have uh, like as if the angel Gabriel gave us a piece of writing that you're quoting the angel Gabriel. Uh, we are quoting people who wrote that the angel Gabriel Gabriel said this, or John the Baptist said this, and these are later writings which have actually evolved the story. We need to get back to the original story, which shows that Jesus is a servant of God, a human being, and a prophet, not the Son of God.